This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. If you're under 30, this might be hard to believe, but Silicon Valley used to be thought of as a hotbed of libertarian thought. In fact, a lot of big Silicon Valley companies used to brag that they didn't have a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. because they considered the regulatory landscape irrelevant to what they were doing. Fast forward, though, to the late 1990s, early 2000s, everything changed when the Justice Department brought a huge antitrust suit against Microsoft, which resulted in a settlement and some humiliation by Bill Gates. So today, we think of Silicon Valley as almost PC orthodoxy enforcers. We have companies like Twitter and Facebook making de facto editorial decisions and deplatforming people like Alex Jones. So we have a great talk today for you from our own Peter Klein, who actually presented this at our supporter summit last week on, on the subject of how socialism came to Silicon Valley. You're really going to enjoy this. Peter did a great job. Have a great weekend. You know, we're all here this morning. It, like, If you're like me, I was uh, scrambling to find a copy, a paper copy of the schedule to check the timings and everyone's titles because I haven't been using the paper schedule. I've been using a schedule on my uh, electronic device, right? So if you think about the industries with which you interact uh, on the most frequent basis nowadays, aside from industries associated with food, clothing, and shelter, right? The technology sector is probably the one that you deal with on a daily basis more than any other. It's hard to imagine now what life would be like without Google, without uh, without Maps, without Apple, Samsung, and so forth. Uh, life before the internet was, you know, nasty, poor, brutish, and short. Uh, <laughs> for those of us who remember it. Uh, of course, we have our own challenges now. So, uh, you know, it really is hard to identify an industry over the last three, four, five decades that has had a bigger impact on the world than the technology industry, which, of course, is a global industry, but uh, is centered around, uh, centered upon Silicon Valley uh, in, 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 in California. It has been for, for many years. Uh, and the U.S. continues to be the world leader in... Uh, not in manufacturing of technology products, but certainly in design, administration, and in software, and in many other parts of that sector. It's a great American capitalist success story. And yet, right, there are many things about the technology sector uh, that make many, us, many of us uncomfortable. Okay, so um, ideologically, Silicon Valley appears to be much less... Uh, uh, sort of a lodestar of capitalism and almost like a bastion of socialism, right? If you look at kind of the words and, and uh, uh, belief systems and so forth associated with that industry, with that uh, part of the world. I mean, remember, this, this is not, if, 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 if tech executives are socialists, they're champagne socialists, Right, I mean, Jeff Bezos, uh, CEO of Amazon, is the richest person in the world, and depending on how you measure, maybe the richest person who ever lived. Uh, Apple is a one trillion dollar company. Uh, Amazon is not quite in Walmart's neighborhood, but it's getting close. Uh, Amazon had about 187 billion dollars of sales in 2017, which is uh, you know about a third of Walmart's total sales. Um, but who, who, what are the people like who operate? these companies, the people who work for these businesses, the people who are the liaisons between the technology sector and the, the, the beast in Washington, D.C. Well, I mean, you know, there are lots of ways to sort of look at this. You, uh, one, one study estimated that uh, if, if you look at uh, uh, campaign contributions in the 2016 presidential election, there was about $8.1 million given by tech executives uh, employee, and employees, 95% of that went to the Clinton campaign. Uh, so 7.7 .7 million was donated by Silicon Valley types to Hillary Clinton's campaign. Trump got about 4% of that total. Uh, you know, we used to talk about Silicon Valley as an outpost of libertarian thinking, right? The tech, tech executives in the 70s and 80s were thought to be kind of libertarian in spirit. And of course, you do have a few people like Peter Thiel who, uh, and Patrick Byrne, who explicitly uh, uh, advocate for you know, blockchain and, uh, and similar technologies as a means of liberating people from the state. But, but you know, 
uh, even poor Gary Johnson got less than 1% of all of the campaign contributions in the 2016 president, presidential election, the libertarian candidate uh, uh, Gary Johnson. Lately, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of concern about the big social media companies, Facebook, Twitter, uh, um, YouTube, which is owned by Google and so forth, you know, uh, imposing either outright bans or so-called shadow bans on conservative and libertarian thinkers, right? Closing their accounts for making you know, politically incorrect remarks uh, or, or, you know, adjusting the algorithm that the that these uh, platforms use to, to display stories in certain order, uh, in a certain order and so forth, so that people are less likely to see uh, um, posts from individuals and groups that are thought to be, you know, politically suspect. Um, uh, if you do a Google search, even Trump alleges that, right, if you search for Donald Trump on Google, Google has either designed the algorithm in such a way, or there are people explicitly coding it such a way that, you know, Stormy Daniels is the number one hit or whatever if you search for, for, for Donald Trump. Uh, L L Lou Rockwell even mentioned in his remarks yesterday that companies like PayPal have refused to deal with you know, websites and uh, uh, publishers and so forth, you know, who have kind of sort of disreputable ideas. And there's the whole crusade emphasized over the last few months about fake news and that how it's the responsibility of Facebook and Twitter and other social media firms to weed out the fake news. Of course, what is fake news? Well, the usual definition of fake news is, you know, news not approved by the state, right, and the, and the established media companies and so forth. So there's a lot of pressure on uh, technology firms to put policies in place that make sure that only sort of approved opinions get out and are seen by people and so forth. Some of you may have seen, uh, oh, it was about three weeks ago, I think, uh, I believe it was Breitbart, uh, produced uh, 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 or shared a leaked video, a video of, a, of an all hands meeting at Google a few days after the 2016 election or the first one of their company wide meetings that took place after the election uh, with all of the top uh, executives at Google, inc including the founders, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, you know, crying and People were sort of, you know, singing "We Shall Overcome" and so forth, as people expressed their their sorrow and uh, how hurt they were about the election results and so forth. Um, th there, there was one survey of uh, political opinions among Google employees, suggesting that those who identified as conservative or libertarian, you know, felt highly uncomfortable sharing their views with their colleagues, as you can imagine. And you may remember the incident from 2017 where an engineer at Google named James Damore uh, published an internal memo. Uh, I think it was called uh, Google's Ideological Echo Chamber, complaining that there was a lack of viewpoint diversity within Google on issues not just related to politics, but on issues such as uh, gender diversity in the workplace and that it was harmful to Google pro professionally that uh, there was only sort of one official view that was allowed on these kind of social issues and that it would be better for the firm, better for creativity and so forth if there were a little bit more diversity of opinion. Of course, then th that memo was outed and he was abruptly fired by Google in what was kind of a PR blow for Google, at least among people like us, right? And I, even when I was looking the other day for checking the date on that, uh, most of the news articles refer to him as, you know, the anti-diversity guy who wrote an anti-diversity screed. I mean, it wasn't an anti-diversity screed. It was actually a pro-diversity argument if we, if we mean diversity of opinion, right? He said, well, maybe we ought to think in other ways about, what, you know, why there are relatively few female engineers at in, in Silicon Valley. Maybe it's something other than the patriarchy. Maybe there are other explanations we should explore, but that is described in the media as an anti-diversity stance. Okay, so how can we explain this? How can an industry that is such a great driver of capitalist growth and progress be staffed by people who have such anti-capitalist views? How can we explain that? Well, I mean, first, keep in mind that... Um, you know, if we're talking about the social media companies, right, they maybe are better understood not as technology firms per se, but as media companies, 
Right now, the New York Times is also a very large private for-profit company. The Washington Post, of course, is owned by Amazon, owned by Jeff Bezos, right? So it's, it's not at all surprising that many large, profitable, for-profit enterprises take a very socialist, left-wing, anti-capitalist stance. I mean, we see that in the traditional media. And this has been, uh, uh, you know, there are many explanations offered over the years. G great social theorists like Joseph Schumpeter and F.A. Hayek have pointed out that uh, when you look at the media, universities, other kind of pu the publishing industry, and, and many sort of public intellectuals, uh, the reason that they're so left-wing is not because, you know, smart, articulate people tend to be on the left, but because of a kind of a selection bias that smart and capable people who are kind of uncomfortable with markets and commerce, who like to tell other people what to do, right, tend to select into academia, uh, into journalism, into the media, and so forth, whereas equally smart and capable and articulate people who are comfortable with the world of affairs tend to self-select into business and uh, uh, tend to be pro-capitalism and be in the capitalist sector where we don't see them as much, right? Because their job is not to stand up in front of people and talk, but rather to make goods and services and to you know, make the world a better place. Um, of course, when you are in the universities or you're in uh, the journalism industry, it's to your advantage to be friendly toward the state uh, to support the government. Murray Rothbard, of course, wrote, a bit, wrote about this on many occasions, this kind of unholy alliance between uh, public intellectuals who provide sort of legitimacy and justification for the state in exchange for which they get access, they get privilege, they get special protection, they get public funding and subsidies and so forth. So we shouldn't be surprised that you know, to the extent that Facebook and Twitter and so forth are media companies, that their personnel have the same kind of ideology as other media companies, namely a, an anti-capitalist uh, kind of a view. And of course, there's also a lot of uh, what we might call confirmation bias among media types, right? They interpret events when they look at what's going on, you know, the, the hearings in the in the Senate in the last couple, the U.S. Senate in the last couple of days, hardly anybody in the established media or in these new media companies is, you know, kind of trying to report on the facts of what happened in order to establish some kind of truth or discover the facts of what took place 25 or 30 years ago, right? Every, everything is interpreted to fit into a preconceived narrative, right? And depending on what your preconception is, you describe these events in a way that reinforces your particular ideology. Okay. But what about tech companies specifically, right? Why are, why are, why are Amazon and, and Apple and Microsoft and firms like that, why, why are their executives and employees, why do they tend to have this particular ideology? I mean, let's keep in mind that these are private for-profit companies. Okay, whatever you feel about Twitter or Facebook, I mean, their assets are owned by investors, shareholders. These are private companies. Their their business is to make is to make profits by providing goods and services to consumers. And of course, these companies have tremendous created tremendous value for human beings, right? For consumers, for humanity, uh, in 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 the last few decades. So there's no doubt about that. But of course, we don't live in a pure capitalist economy. We don't live in a free market society. We live in a mixed economy in which many firms can become large and influential, not merely by providing goods and services that people want, but also by kind of cozying up to, uh, cozying up to the state. Right? And of course, we know from history, you know, Patrick talked uh, yesterday about uh, the, his work uh, editing Rothbard's book on the progressive era. Right throughout history, many big business people have not been pro market, but have been pro subsidy, pro privilege, uh, in a way that benefits uh, themselves. So we shouldn't be surprised that large, wealthy, um, uh, you know, profitable companies can be staffed by people who are not pro market. Um, yeah, and again, I think the social media companies are like media companies in that they don't want to offend the powers that be. A good example is Google, you know, has uh, allegedly is working closely with government officials in China to make sure that Google 
kind of enables the, the sort of censorship that is common in China in order to gain access to that market. Uh, there was, you might remember the whole thing in a uh, big issue in 2016 where the FBI wanted Apple to unlock an iPhone to be able to provide some information about uh, a criminal case. And um, <laughs> Apple CEO Tim Cook made a big deal of opposing the FBI on these grounds. That kind of stuff is just a sham, right? That's, that's theater. That's political theater. In reality, the tech companies work very closely with the NSA and the CIA and the FBI and other government and their equivalents around the world to, you know, partner with law enforcement in, a, in, an, in, a, in an appropriate manner to make sure that no one can use their technologies for, you know, uh, inappropriate purposes. Uh, again, as Patrick pointed out, uh, when we look at the progressive era, right, many of the, the rules and regulations that were allegedly designed to protect consumers and the public from harmful big businesses were really, you know, written by and designed by those business, big businesses directly in order to protect them against their younger, smaller uh, competitors. I was really struck by uh, a couple of scenes earlier this year when, you know, they had those hearings in the U.S. Congress and they made Mark Zuckerberg appear before Congress and explain what Facebook is doing to get, you know, to keep out the Russian bots and so forth, make sure the Russians don't steal the election for, for Trump. And at one point, you know, Zuckerberg said, uh, you know, look, there's a real danger in allowing uh, the government to have influence on, you know, information channels. And then just a few moments uh, uh, then he pointed out, and we, Facebook, we're not a small company. You know, we're a large, dominant firm. It's relatively easy for us to work with you, Congress, to meet your rules and restrictions. Uh, but it's much harder for smaller, younger companies like we, Facebook, once were. And so Zuckerberg, you know, he's basically stating the thesis that Rothbard emphasized, right, that... Uh, Regulation helps often helps big businesses at the expense of smaller businesses. So hence, big business typically favors regulation that imposes more costs on younger and smaller rivals than on big business it itself. You know, and then 10 minutes later in the hearing, he says to another uh, uh, congressperson, oh, we at Facebook would, would be delighted to work with you in designing the rules that will govern cyberspace, you know, to make sure we get rid of fake news. Well, did nobody pick up on the sort of juxtaposition between those two remarks? Um, okay, so uh, what is you know what does government do to help the technology sector? Why would why would tech firms have a more favorable opinion of government than they otherwise would? Well, I mean, in some cases it's obvious, right? There's some obvious cases of cronyism. Elon Musk comes to mind, right? So let's let's put that aside because that one's too obvious. Uh, there are more subtle ways in which government intervention helps these companies. There's intellectual property protection, right? So most software products are, are copyrighted. Uh, other technologies, uh, hardware relies heavily on the patent system. So in a, in a world of a, of a different kind of intellectual property regime, uh, there might be different business models that these firms would need to use, uh, and, and which might, might be much more costly for them. Uh, there's the internet itself which the origins of which owes a lot to government intervention, right? The internet evolved out of the so-called ARPANET, which was a Defense Department project from the 1960s and 1970s. I, I wrote an article in the free market many years ago called Government Did Create the Internet, But the Free Market Made It Glorious, which got a lot of downloads, a lot of hits on Mises.org, arguing that, yeah, the government did play a big role in the development of the internet, but that kind of was harmful rather than helpful. The internet might be better today if it had not been for massive government subsidies. So I'm obviously not making a claim like the one associated with the British uh, uh, academic uh, Mariana Matsukato, who says, well, the government is really, we really owe the government a big uh, word of thanks for the development of technology, and therefore we need more regulation and more subsidies and so forth. I'm making the opposite claim. The government has had a big impact in helping some technologies and technology companies, but to the detriment of the overall working of, uh, of the system. But another uh, one, one piece of intervention that's not talked about very much is a certain part of 
uh, a 1996 law called the Communications Decency Act, which was sold to the public as a way of protecting, you know, minors from harmful and abusive material online. Uh, but there was a little piece called Section 230. Now, the Communications Decency Act itself was struck down by the Supreme Court as being overly broad, but the Section 230 provision remains. It explicitly gives internet firms immunity for any kind of sort of you know, common law tort action like defamation or libel for material that is published on those platforms, right? So in other words, if the New York Times publishes an article, uh, an article that is, you know, uh, defamatory towards Tom DiLorenzo, I mean, I know that's shocking to imagine, um, you know, Tom DiLorenzo could potentially sue, uh, he could sue for defamation, he could sue for libel or whatever, uh, and the argument would be, well, the New York Times is a curated platform, I mean, some you know, maybe Patrick Newman wrote the article, but it was published in the New York Times, edited by the New York Times, so the New York Times is legally liable for the content of its publication. But Section 230 says that Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and so forth are not legally responsible for content that is on their platforms, right? So you, some people have interpreted this as a kind of a subsidy that allows social media firms to it made their business model more viable, allowed them to attract investment and other forms of capital that maybe they wouldn't have been able to attract if investors were concerned that they could be subject to big uh, losses in litigation. And so the argument always was, well, the New York Times is, you know, sort of constructed from the top down. We're just an open platform where anybody can post anything. So you can't hold us responsible for what people post. Well, if that's the case, then those companies cannot now be going through and removing fake news and banning certain authors and so forth. Well, now you're like the New York Times. Now you're curating. You can't simultaneously curate and be immune from responsibility for what is published. But that's what uh, um, uh, that's what this legislation imposes. Uh, wh one more thing, too, that uh, might also be relevant is the famous antitrust case against Microsoft in the mid-1990s. You know, before that time, U.S. tent companies were, were pretty apolitical. They didn't donate to co Congress people. They didn't have lobbying offices in D.C. and so forth. After the antitrust case against Microsoft, they all stepped up and started donating money to politicians. They all set up big lobbying branches in D.C. So you could look at the antitrust trial as a kind of a shakedown, right? If antitrust is kind of an extortion racket. So the government lets it be known that, hey, if you don't play ball, we're going to come down on you. And after that, they, play, they played ball. So what do we do about this? Um, I, I certainly don't support the calls you hear from some conservatives that, well, we, the government needs to regulate content and force them to include conservative views on, you know, force Facebook and Twitter, not, don't let them ban conservatives, force them to have a balanced kind of opinion, treat uh, these platforms like so-called common carriers where anybody has to be allowed to use it. I think that's a you know, that's a cure worse than the disease, right? So I think there are two solutions. In the short run, those of us who are not satisfied with the ideological goods and services being provided by tech companies have a simple option. Don't use them, right? Don't use the platforms that you find objectionable. Don't buy from the providers and don't buy the products that, uh, uh, you know, run by people whose opinions you dislike or find harmful. Use alternative products and services, of which there are many to choose from. But of course, the long run, as it won't, it won't surprise you to hear, is to shrink the state so that there are fewer benefits accruing to entrepreneurs from partnering with and cozying up to the state. So thank you very much. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.